all gone silent on the screen, as the case may be. And if you don't know how to do it, look right, look left, one of you on the neighbors, maybe. And I often fumble, that's why I'm saying that you might want to do that. And let me formally welcome all of you to this series that the India Habitat Center has, I think, very thoughtfully initiated. This is over a year since we started the Changing Asia series. And the Society for Policy Studies is very glad to be associated with the Habitat. And I want to thank Ms. Dave, the Joint Director of the India Habitat Center, who was out this evening, and Mr. Kakar, the Director, who's not here, for the sustained support they've given us. And if I could just take a minute about, you know, for some of you who are new to this particular series, A, welcome on board. And the way in which the Habitat Society, the Society for Policy Studies series works is that a few years ago, you know, this was the sort of received wisdom here in the Habitat amongst the members. And those of us who have an interest in matters of public policy, that a city, any city or, you know, frankly, any collective is known by various aspects of its culture, its history and its discourse. So we talk about cities that have museums, cities that have galleries, but also whether or not that collective, the demographic collective, whether it's a city or a town or a bus or a cusp or whatever, has an ecosystem that enables the equivalent of a civil society discourse to be able to exchange ideas, thoughts, discuss issues as candidly, objectively as is possible. And it was in that spirit that we felt that perhaps Delhi could do something about nurturing the public lecture. And Clearly, if we talk about a public lecture, you know, it's a two-way activity between the speaker, he or she who takes the trouble of agreeing to deliver a lecture of this nature, and the audience. And the Habitat, I think, helped us to put this together. And I'm very happy to say that it's a little over a year since we started the Changing Asia series, and we've had some very eminent speakers. And it's in that sense that we felt that we could sustain the series and look at a range of subjects, not necessarily security, foreign policy, international relations. And it was in that context that today's choice, all of you have the invitation, it's about the journey of the Indian woman. In that sense, again, you know, when you talk about a metric, I try to say that a city or any urban or any social context whether or not the group can engage in useful discourse is one indicator. But by the same token, I'm a security analyst. And over the years, I think, another way of looking or a metric that we might want to keep in mind is human security. And within the ambit of human security, where there are many, I would say, tangible indicators, gender security is an often ignored aspect. And if you look at the literature, it's often said that if you can just address gender, the security of the girl, child, and women, more than half, shall we say, of the challenge has been addressed in a very useful and convincing way. But alas, this is not an issue that gets the kind of attention it needs. And as I said, one can talk about some of the less flattering statistics. But at the same time, we in India can also, I think, celebrate and take joy in the triumph of many of our women and girls. And I think most recently, the way in which Miss Sindhu of badminton fame and her other colleagues, younger colleagues, who saved India the blush as far as the recent Olympics was concerned, it's just one example. So it's not that the story or the picture is only geek. I think we have a number of our young ladies and women who have triumphed despite the odds. And Ambassador Mukherjee, Vashwati Mukherjee will walk us through this particular the trajectory of the Indian woman, as it were, and place it in a larger context. I want to thank her, Vashwati, for taking this on, because I know how much work she has done to put this lecture together. 
she herself, as I said, I will not detail the CV that we have already circulated, but she's had a fantastic track record in the foreign service as a diplomat. Please note, we are not referring to her as a woman diplomat. She's just a diplomat. And done India proud in many fora. I remember when Nirmaya happened, she was in Paris at that time, in the Netherlands, and you know, she was able, sorry, able to again, I think, you know, uh, deal with the fallout at that time and also convey to her colleagues and interlocutors in Europe about what India is doing about it, about it. And she's done various, I would say, other things, but she's also a very diligent and a very methodical, if I may use the word, uh, she does her homework, let me put it that way. Ever since we spoke about this and I requested her, she very, I would say, willingly agreed to take this challenge on, take this task on of delivering a lecture on. You know, it seems like to be an easy subject, but actually it's not. And to be able to bring something to the table, she was kind enough to share her text with me. So I think all I can say is that we have very rich fare as far as the subject is concerned. So on that note, please note that I have not introduced her formally and left the CV for you to ponder over. Oh, there was a that please ask. And again, I'm requesting those of you who have just joined, please put your phones on silent so that we have your undivided attention. We do not encourage you to tweet so that we can pay attention to the speaker. You know, all of that can be done later if you wish. And if you must, I'm sitting here, eagle-eyed. So do it in a way that I don't see you or that you disturbing the rhythm of the speaker. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. And please tweet away if you want. Master, please come. <laughs> No, no, I'm just kidding. I was just going to say I can see my sister in law tweeting, so <laughs> she will now immediately stop tweeting. <laughs> Thank you very much, Uday, for that uh, very nice introduction. I'm not sure I deserve it. Um, I'm very happy to be here today with all of you, uh, some of my friends from college days, feminists like me, who made the same journey as I have, are here today, along with friends from the Foreign Service, the Ambassador of Sudan, the Greek Ambassador and Dutch Ambassador will be joining us, uh, as also Mr. Manishankar Raya and Mr. Kapil Sibal. Uh, this is to show actually the solidarity with our men in public life have called the business cause and I'm very happy about that. <clears throat> when this challenge was put to me uh, by Uday and his team, uh, by Torun, uh, I hesitated because it's a subject which is very close to my heart. And when it's a subject very close to your heart, it is difficult sometimes to be totally objective about it. So I wasn't sure whether I really was the right selected speaker for the event, but having taken on the challenge, uh, I also did, as I suggested, which is to also make a comparison between the Indian woman's journey and that of the Pakistani and Chinese woman, to put it in a context, uh, so that we can also see clearly where we are, where we need to be, how far have we slipped behind, if we have, etc. So, let me first begin by saying, since I have spent a uh, many years of my career in, in France and Geneva and Francophone countries, and I speak French like English, that it was a very famous French philosopher who once said, plus que ça change, plus que c'est la même chose. Which really means that the more things change, the more status quo prevails. Very, very true as far as the journey of the Indian woman is concerned. Now, I'm going to take you through the journey, but to begin with, I'm going to say that in my perspective, inequality prevails everywhere, but that unequal status of the Indian woman is most noticeable, in my opinion, in rural India today. Change has come to some sections of the urban areas, not everywhere, in, in large sections. And the 21st century educated Indian woman, the professional Indian woman, in our urbanized city centers are now very different from her sisters in the village, particularly in rural North India, what we Bengalis call the cow belt, because it's so different from Bengal. But change has also come 
to these conservative rural areas and that change has brought with it other issues. It has brought social up upheaval, it has brought inter-caste feuding and the economic upward mobility that it has brought to some sections of the underprivileged rural woman has also caused problems for that woman when she comes to take those new rights of hers and move on on that journey. Uh, Uday had mentioned about the Nirbhaya case. I have to say that this new and ugly phenomenon that has brought disrepute to India and to Delhi, the phenomenon of institutionalized violence against women, is a phenomenon which is a challenge to our very civilization and culture. And it casts a long shadow of our image abroad, which those of us who served abroad, particularly as ambassadors as I have, have come to know with great chagrin and with sadness. I was ambassador of India to the Netherlands when nearby occurred. I woke up in the morning and found that the Dutch had left a lot of white flowers outside my residence, which is called India Bhavan, to express their sympathy with an Indian woman who has somehow survived and made it as ambassador, how has she survived, what was her journey, etc. I rang up the external affairs minister of the day and told him that I would like to open a condolence book in the embassy and I would like to grieve with the Dutch and I would like to go live on Dutch television and explain to them that what happened was an aberration, it can happen anywhere, why did it happen, etc. I have to tell you that some of my male colleagues, batchmates, who were ambassadors with me, were completely against this idea. They thought that this was a very feminist approach and that we should just say that this is an aberration and full stop. Fortunately, the, the external affairs minister of the time, uh, this was in uh, the time of Nebaya, he agreed with me. I opened the condolence book, we grieved together, I explained to D the Dutch what is the position of the Indian women, what is the problem, etc. And I explained to them that in my opinion, this was an aberration in our society and not a customary occurrence. Today, facing you in 2016, I'm not so sure that what I said was correct. But all I can say is that on his very first Republic Day address in January 2013, the President of India, Sri Pranab Mukherjee, said, and I quote, because it's very appropriate what he said, there is a law of the land, but there is also a higher law. The sanctity of a woman is a directive principle of that larger edifice called Indian civilization. Mother is our protection from evil and oppression, our symbol of life and prosperity. When we brutalize a woman, we wound the soul of our civilization." Unquote. I completely agree with the President. He actually put his finger on it. We are in the process of wounding the very soul of our civilization <coughs> by what we are doing in this manner. Let me begin the journey. When did the decline of the status of Indian women begin? When did it all start? Some historians, and I'm a historian before I became a diplomat, some historians are quick to point out that equal status of women in our society is part of India's civilizational norms, is part of its culture, and part of its history. I find this highly questionable, having done history myself. It is true that in some parts of India, including Kerala, for instance, we do have a matriarchal system. Point taken. Point is also taken that in the Rig Vedic period, it has been said, though in my opinion it's poorly catalogued, that women enjoy equal status with men. And that the decline started later. It has been quoted that Gautam Buddha, who predated Christ, was able to, through his teachings, give lower caste women, along with men, I have to say, an opportunity to escape from the discrimination practiced against them in the caste-ridden Brahmanical structure of those days. This has been portrayed by Rabindranath Tagore in Chandalika, where a lower caste woman becomes a Buddhist nun to escape discrimination. But the decline and decadence of Hindu society from that time along with the distortions of the caste system 
actually started impacting the position of society in the later Vedic period onwards. By the time we come to the Guptas, and regardless of what has been written about Hindu, about Indian poetesses and those who have written in literature, etc., etc., regardless of all that, there is no doubt, if you look at the Smriti Shastras, that the position of women started declining even further. And of course, the most glaring example of the time was the Manu Smriti, where in chapter 9, and some of you may have heard, I don't think His Excellency the Sudanese ambassador has heard, and I don't want to, to shock him, but the Manu Smriti said that a woman at birth was the property of her father, after marriage the property of her husband, and in old age the property of her son. And actually, this argument was put forward at that time, also for economic reasons, to argue that a woman has no property rights. Because if she is herself the property of her father, of her husband and of her son, then how can she own property in her own right? The Gupta period witnessed increasing child marriage, sati, prostitution, the Devdasi system and polygamy. Upper class women were gradually forced into seclusion and were educated only in arts and music. And that was the period of time when the women were told that they could not read the sacred texts. This was a prerogative only reserved for men. Then we come to the 10th century onwards. The reason why I said it, put, give you a view in detail, the Hindu period as we call it, the ancient period, is that it is important to know that the decline of status of women started long before the Muslims came to it. Because you would find some people trying to explain that the decline started only from 10th century onwards. The decline started long before that. From the 10th century onwards, there was indeed a steep decline, further decline. India saw a series of invasions across the Khyber Pass. It brought new culture, it brought social norms, which India assessed, assimilated or rejected. And in the process, we got the institutionalized parda for, for uh, Muslims and the gungan for Hindus. Just the same, in my opinion. And which marked a retrograde step backwards for women, cutting across religion and society. And that's how the decline started. Let me then move quickly to colonial rule and our national movement. Under colonial rule and with the introduction of English and modern education, there were some positive changes. After the first war for freedom in 1857, we had a reformist movement which started in Bengal and which gradually spread all over India. You had Raja Ramon Roy and his followers who introduced important changes which were carried forward by the Brahma Sabha, which was a movement of reformist Bengali Brahmins to fight social oppression. Jawahar Sarkar, the CEO of Prasad Bharti, who will be with us, is actually an expert. He's written a lot on this subject. Um, the Brahma Sabha tried to abolish sati, polygamy, and child marriage, and to encourage widow remarriage. There were, of course, hiccups, as you would remember, in the case of Keshav Chandra Sen, etc. But nevertheless, there was also an effort to bring back property and inheritance rights for women. And that's very important, because along with a social revolution, you do need an economic revolution because women are entitled to property rights. Hi, Binakshi. Uh, and subsequently, women were able to play a very important part in the independence movement, national movement, with Mahatma Gandhi. Now, a lot has been written about Gandhi, his experiments with truth, was he really a liberated man, etc., etc. In my view, from what I have read of Gandhi as a history student, Gandhi saw the veil, the gungat or the parda, as a retrograde effort to push women back. He supported women's education. He supported widow remarriage. He tried to change the conservative social norms. And way back in his time, he wrote that woman is the companion of man, gifted with equal mental capacities. She has the right to participate in the minutest of details and activities of man. And she has an equal right of freedom and liberty with him. It took a lot of courage for Mahatma Gandhi at that time, just after he got back from South Africa to write these lines. So I would say that looking at it from a strictly impartial perspective, setting aside the controversy of the experiments of truth, with truth, etc., Gandhiji on the whole, you could give him uh, you could give him a good good chit for trying to move women forward. Thanks to that. <laughs> it's always very complex when you talk about Gandhi in a gathering like this. 
When we, when we adopted the Indian Constitution on 26 January 1950, we enshrined the rights of women in the fundamental rights. As so women were very gung ho, the rights included equal pay for equal work, which came much later to the American woman. And there were also renunciation of practices derogatory to the dignity of women, just and humane conditions of work and maternity relief. In fact, most people, when they read our constitution abroad, then used to ask me that with so many wonderful rights enshrined for your women, what is happening in India? So I thought it was important for me to, to bring this into my lecture. The legal empowerment of women, the theoretical legal empowerment of women in India began in 1947 with the Indian constitution. And of course, these rights did bring some opportunities for women. One cannot deny it. There were equal educational opportunities in theory. There were equal opportunities for entry into civil service. A lot of us benefited from that. Minakshi here, who joined the IAS, I joined the foreign service. A lot of us did benefit from those equal opportunities. But the problem was the actual implementation. Hi, Johar, come and sit in front. I was just remembering you and the Brahma Sabha. Come and sit next to the Master of Sudan. Come, Ish, Ashan, come, come. Uh, so as I was saying, that there were, there were improvements, but the whole issue was implementation of those rights. And why were there so many difficulties? The roadblocks arose out of poverty, underdevelopment, very conservative social values in large segments of our population. I can't just blame the cow belt. There were very conservative social uh, sections in, West, in Bengal, where I come from, all over India. But another very important issue, which I think we tend to forget, is that when the British left India in 47, our literacy rates were quite appalling. They were 31% for men and 22% for women. Very low literacy rates obviously means that you would have conservative social values, you would find it difficult to have a social revolution, etc., etc. So, one of the things that successive Indian governments did to take forward the empowerment of women was to focus on education. Now, even in education, there were many, many uh, difficulties. The first difficulty was a com great resistance to co-education, which I remember very well when I was uh, going to school. Co-education was something which was very rare in Delhi when I was growing up. Today, it's, it's completely universal, which is a very good development. Then there was a shortage of women teachers. There was an absence of girls' toilets. And as a result, and also because of the ignorance of the mother, who was illiterate, there was a reticence to send the girl child to school. There were also these ingrained social biases, which were very nicely, if I may put it sarcastically, encapsulated by a famous Telugu poet of the time, who said that educating a girl child is like watering a plant in your neighbor's garden. With this, this kind of attitude, what do you expect the poor girl child to have? So, uh, women's education gradually spread, and with it, there were some positive developments. But this unfortunately happened only in some states. In other states, in the North Indian heartland, also in Bihar and Jharkhand, in some other parts of India, where the fruits of economic de development did not percolate down to the lowest levels, the education did not remain very less. Now let me, let me move then to the problems of today. The problem of today, that is the roadblocks in the journey towards equal status, let me first focus with the phenomenon of institutionalized violence against the Indian woman. When did this happen? Why has there been now so much of gang rape, rape, domestic violence, acid throwing, etc., etc.? When did it start? Was it always there? My feeling is, it must have been always there. We didn't have such a good media in those days. But it has multiplied. It has increased. Our cities have become more insecure. Why? Our cities have become insecure because the rural urban divide has become very complex. But it is also important to remember that institutionalized violence against women is a phenomenon worldwide. Violent assaults on women and rape 
have been considered through centuries to be a legitimate tactic of war, to humiliate the enemy, and to protect one's own. Today, it is being practiced systematically by the ISIS against women whom they consider to be infidels, and it is being practiced by other extremist groups, including the Boko Haram in Nigeria. Therefore, one has to conclude with great sadness that acts of war, external or civil, are often accompanied by extraordinarily cruel acts of violence and rape and assault of women because it is considered to be a highly effective form of intimidation of the enemy. But in India, something else also happened. What happened was that an upward, upwardly mobile, newly created lower middle class from the villages, from the rural areas, came to urban India, which was becoming slowly progressive, socially emancipated in some areas, and even forward-looking. In the clash of these two Indias, institutionalized violence against women started increasing at a very alarming rate. Since our judicial process is complex and time-consuming, bystander, bystanders and witnesses who could have stopped or been of some help preferred to look aside. And as a result, our cities became unsafe. When this happened, our women became subjected to increasing public pressure from conservatives and sometimes from their own family members to conform, to dress for the occasion, to give up some of their social freedoms, not to, not to travel late at night, etc., etc. And then, of course, you have these famous cup panchayats uh, where women have been urged to marry at 14, not to carry mobile phones, not to wear skirts or western dress, etc., etc. In other words, the social discourse was, please, ladies, if you want to escape assault and rape, please be obedient, please be submissive, please understand that the onus is on you to avoid being raped or assaulted. This change in the social discourse, in my view, marks a fundamental change from the Delhi and from the India in which I grew up in, in the 60s and 70s. Let me now move to the journey of the Pakistani woman. Is the situation similar or different in South Asia? Are we an aberration or what is happening in India is it happening elsewhere? Let me begin with Pakistan. When we trace the journey of the, of the Indian woman across millennia, we have to remember that it was also the journey of the Pakistani woman before partition. Pre-1947, Muslim women who are now in Pakistan's Punjab played an important role in the freedom struggle and in the Quit India movement. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, believed in women's rights. His sister, Fatima Jinnah, a leading crusader for women and a very famous dentist in her own right, may have become the first woman president of a predominantly Muslim majority nation had General Ayub Khan at that time allowed free and fair elections. What happened later? What happened in Pakistan? Why is it generally now acknowledged that the status of the Pakistani woman is one of systematic gender subordination? In my view, as in most feudal conservative societies, the unequal status of the Pakistani woman varies across classes, across regions, and across the rural-urban divide. There have also been some positive developments for the Pakistani woman, but these have been overshadowed recently by the overwhelming influence of the conservative religious class in Pakistan, who are antagonistic towards the issue of equal status of women in Pakistani society. If you look at the evidence that is coming out, it has been said that the testimony, testimony of a woman in court carries half the weight of a man. Rape victims are not allowed to use DNA evidence to prove their case. A blind woman who was raped was punished for being an adulteress. There has been huge increase in domestic abuse, child marriages and forced marriages, while honor killings is another dishonorable crime which is becoming increasingly common in Pakistan. Literacy rates too demonstrate that the educational status of the Pakistani woman is among the lowest in the world. 
even today it is 45% for women. And the attitude towards women in Pakistani culture makes the fight for educational equality even more difficult. The lack of democracy and the feudal practices of Pakistan across Pakistan also contributes to the gender gap in the educational system. Feudalism in Pakistan has left the underpowered woman in a very vulnerable situation. Though they have the right, theoretically, to get, a, get education, in many rural regions of Pakistan, women and girls are strongly discouraged from going to school and discriminated against. There have been violent acts such as acid throwing at girls who are going to school in order to deter them from going to school. The infant mortality rate is very high and there, are, there is a sh great shortage of trained healthcare providers for women during delivery. A lot has been said by Pakistan about its very young Nobel laureate, Malala Yousafzai, who became the youngest recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. But in my view, one Malala cannot change the unequal status of women in Pakistan. She can be a symbol for the struggle, for the journey ahead. But if you look at it from a strictly objective perspective, Malala has not been able to change anything within Pakistan for her Pakistani sister. And the journey of the Pakistani woman towards equal status, in my opinion, is conditional on Pakistan's own journey towards a more egalitarian, less feudal, less conservative, and more democratic society. Let me then move to China. What is happening in the People's Republic of China? The long march of the Chinese woman in the 19th and 20th centuries resulted in a significant improvement in their status after the revolution and the establishment of the modern communist state. Nevertheless, and despite the difficulties in obtaining data in what essentially, even today, is a very close society, there is compelling evidence regarding the unequal status of the Chinese woman be it in healthcare, access to education, or violence against women. Until the formal abolition in 2015 of China's infamous, now infamous, one child policy, there is documentary evidence regarding forced abortions, forced sterilizations, adoption, and female infanticide, all of which constitute a gross violation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child to which China is a state. On education, there is an increasing gender gap and it's becoming wider as you go up the, social, the, the, the ladder from primary to secondary to tertiary education. In healthcare, women do not have priority in healthcare. Healthcare is still tailored to focus on, on men. And then there is the phenomenon of the missing women, which Dr. Amartya Sen has written about. Dr. Amartya Sen has asserted in 1990 that over 100 million women are missing globally. And he has documented that 50 million women are missing from China alone. He has attributed this deficit worldwide to sex selection abortion, female infanticide, and inadequate nutrition for girls, all of which applies equally to India, by the way. As far as domestic violence is concerned, the All China Women's Federation in 04 compiled results to show that 30% of the Chinese woman is subjected to gross domestic violence inside their home. And in a vast country like China, like India, the status of women declines in rural areas and in its far flung autonomous regions. For example, I picked up some, again sarcastically, some very charming quotations among the, some of the minority republics in China. One of which said, firewood serves for winter, a woman serves for her husband's pleasure. Another says, a woman without a husband is like a horse without a halter. Very nice. Very charming. Now, I will not speak much about my own journey as an Indian woman uh, in the service and come back to it in the question and answer season, uh, session. But all I would like to say is that the Indian Foreign Service has come a very long way in changing gender stereotypes. In the early years of the Foreign Service, we were told that if we join Foreign Service, we have to resign if we get married. As a result, Mrs. Rama Mehta, wife of the late Foreign Secretary Jagan Mehta, 
who was actually the topper of her badge, had to resign when she married him. Similarly, when I joined service, I was informed that as a single officer, I would get half the foreign allowance of my married colleagues. Uh, that was very difficult, and it got changed through a Supreme Court injunction. Uh, the first foreign service woman who joined the foreign service courageously and could never get married was Miss Mutamma. She had to go, go to court many times to get her rights established. Uh, the first time she went to court was because they refused to give her a foreign posting or to promote her. And the justification given was no foreign posting can be given to a woman because she may have to do airport duty at night. Uh, she did have to go to Supreme Court to get that reversed. Um, and I actually think we've come a very long way. We've had three women foreign secretaries, beginning with Mrs. Chuki Nair. We've had two women foreign service ambassadors in Washington, Meera Shankar and Deepu Rao. We've had a woman spokesperson. We've had a woman chief of protocol, my friend Ruchira Kamboj. Uh, that was very difficult. And I was the first woman head of administration and personnel, which was regarded as a male bastion because uh, it was based on the theory, popular to, uh, to males, that anything to do with postings and transfers, which is power, should be exercised by a, a man and not by a woman, and certainly not exercised by a woman over men. So this was another big class barrier I broke. And we've had women posted to the Middle East. We've had women ambassadors when bombing was going on in Libya and Lebanon. In Af Afghanistan, we had a deputy who was in Kabul under very diff difficult circumstances. And today we have a 100% visually handicapped woman who's joined foreign service. I've met her. Uh, she's an amazing woman, Beno Zafi. She joined foreign service, 100% handicapped, and she's gone on a foreign posting. So we've gone a long way. I'd like to say that when we speak about the choices that foreign service or civil service women or professional women make uh, when they join service, uh, there is a very uh, very interesting um, quotation which I have taken from Sylvia Plath, the famous uh, British poet who committed suicide when challenges facing her in her professional life became too much for her. She said in 1963 in the jail bar, in the jail, uh, in the bell jar, that I saw my life branching out before me like the green fig tree. One fig was a husband and a happy home and children. And the other fig was a famous poet. I wanted each and every one of them, but choosing one meant losing all the rest. Actually, I think Sylvia Plath has in 1963 put her finger on the professional dilemma facing the professional woman of today in India, everywhere, where you have to make these very difficult choices which are only asked of you and not of your male spouse or male partner. Now, I will come back to my own journey much later. All that I would like to say in my own journey is that I do believe firmly that there is no single role model for an empowered woman. I stand before you as an empowered woman, but I am not a role model for anyone. I made my life and I live it according to the actions which I took and I knew fully well what the consequences were. If I have regrets, I have to keep them to myself because the choice was mine. Looking back, I do believe that maybe I could have made better choices, but the world of the Indian Foreign Service of July 1976 when I joined and the world of today are two very different worlds. There were no mobile phones, there was no form of communication. When, you, when I went to Paris on my first posting, it was like going into exile. I did not know the language. I had never seen people driving outside India. Now, of course, everyone in Delhi drives like the way they do in Rome and Paris. Not at that time, there were hardly any cars in Delhi. I, had, I learned to drive, hamburger style like the French, push the front part of the car with my bumper, push the back part of the car with my bumper, squeeze it in and squeeze it out. I learned to speak French. But it was a journey which could have broken me that it did not, was fortunate. Some are broken by the experience 
others make it. Now, when we talk about the continuation of the journey, where do we go from here? I believe that the journey is a dynamic process, but the status quo has changed. The process of implementation of fundamental rights and subsequent parliamentary legislation has had a definitive impact on some women, but unfortunately not all women. The nation is changing. There is much greater support from men, some men, regarding the need for equal status. Many rights have been gained, and I do believe that the position of women in India, some women, compared to the perspective of India's neighborhood or globally, may not be as bad, may not be as stark as it is sometimes portrayed outside India, as it has been portrayed to me when I was ambassador of India outside India. E. H. Card in what history has said that facts speak only when the historian calls on them to speak. In a sense, a fact is and cannot be more sacrosanct than a perception. Very true. The perception internationally is that the position of India's women do not do credit to its history, to its culture, to its civilization, to its democratic liberal norms. Uda had said that Delhi has been called the rape capital of the world. My question to all of you is, is this true? Is this fair? How does one change this perception? This calls for deep reflection. Complete victory is only possible when society change, changes and when change percolates to the lowest levels in rural India. Not in the meantime, would flow from economic development. Uh, they could flow, but they don't necessarily. That is why in the UN, UN context, in 1993, the World Conference on Human Rights put economic, social, and cultural rights and civil and political rights on the same level. So a woman's political rights have to come from a process of struggle. Otherwise, even today, you have very conservative societies across the world whose names I will not take, where the women may be economically well off. She doesn't have the right to drive a car. She doesn't have political liberties the way you and I understand it. So I think the two of them go together. Uh, I would request uh, them to, to give a quick English translation for the benefit of our audience. Basically, it's uh, the, the last question. So that you know, it's, the reference is to growing intolerance amongst the Saad countries as far as women are concerned. I am inferring that this also points to the kind of orientation as far as religion is concerned in the larger Saad context, whether we talk about the Islamic ideology or Hindu context, and how is that playing out. I defer to Marshal here, so well, we have views of this. Actually, uh, I don't want to get into the whole issue of uh, of inequalities brought by religion because um, as a Hindu, I have seen so many inequalities which uh, Hindu women have been subjected to that I would hesitate very much to wait in whether a Muslim woman is inequal because of her religion or a Christian woman. When as a Hindu, I know myself how many inequalities Hindu women have to fight against in order to achieve uh, emancipation. That being said, if there is a movement of intolerance, not just in some countries, but in certain parts of the world, uh, and that is impacting the status of women, that is indeed something which is of great concern. And that we are seeing in, for instance, what the Boko Haram did in Nigeria, or the ISIS in some of the atrocities that they have perpetrated against some women. So these, these are very, very sensitive issues where the international community, in my opinion, should get together and fight it completely so that the status of women uh, is not impacted. I can take a last round from here because we promised everyone by quarter past eight. If you are willing to stay, I think happy that man who is loving. Can we make late that Fine. I'll see how it goes. Sir, I'll take you and then I'll come to the family. <laughs>
I think we can hear you from raise your voices. Muslim women are waging a war against Prabhupada Talaq. It is a movement. And I see that there is not much appreciation, you know, uh, in media and in, even in the courts. Court have, you know, thrown the ball back to the government. This is this one comment. Second is, since it is a, the subject is the journey of it, women, not Indian women, but women. Uh, yes. But oh, then women are part of, you know, they are women. The, the women uh, as a gender have been subordinate gender since, since thousands and thousands of years. And, and then the liberation movement started. Why it is started, there, there are reasons which I don't want to go into it. But, uh, you know, it, it started uh, very recently, 200 years back or so. So it will take a long time, you know, a very long time and women have to fight, you know, for their rights. Thank you. So, what she said towards the end, it's a long night. Sir, I don't think you are right when you say that it is up to date for this thing. For the larger part of the journey of women's society, it has been women who have been the anchor. <laughs> matriarchy, continuing matriarchy throughout history, and that's my subject. Sir, may I request a quality? This will happen. We are producing children only. Okay, ma'am, it's possible. Please, please, sir. Only then women get more liberated. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. I'm very thankful. Ma'am, being an Indian woman, and I also want to be, an, I'm aspiring for being a diplomat. I'm a 26 year old girl, like uh, I'm preparing for civil service. Which, which university, which university, Delhi University? I, I have done my master's from Delhi University, uh, and journalism course from IIMC. So I'm a 26 Muslim girl, and like uh, I'm preparing for civil service. And when I say ki, I want to be an Indian Foreign Service, people around me are like, okay, don't give your first preference to administrator because you won't get a good husband or something. <laughs> yeah, actually I faced it. So ma how difficult it is. It's a very personal question ki, to be a women, Indian women diplomat. Being, having a pressure from your family, from the society and all of that. Let me answer uh, the two questions together before I One is about the triple talaq. Now this triple talaq, this is something which has to be worked out in the courts and among the, in my opinion, by the Muslim community themselves because this is Muslim personal law. In our country, uh, we believe that uh, the Muslim community has a right to decide where, to what extent to take the Muslim personal law. I have studied Islamic jurisprudence and Islamic history in Delhi University. Uh, Professor Muhammad Amin was my, was my teacher. And this triple talaq, whenever it was given in history, was never intended to be given in this manner. It, it had a completely different context in the Quran and in the time, in the time in which they had talked about triple talaq. That being said, there are so many religious injunctions which are later on conveniently used, but it is for the community themselves to decide among their men and women how to address the issue of triple talaq. As far as the subordinate position of women are concerned. As I explained in my lecture, the subordinate, there were, it was not a question of subordinate position of women, it was using rights across the journey and trying to get them back. That is what I tried to portray in my lecture. Uh, I thank very much my young friend who, who wants to join the Foreign Service. Uh, I'd like to encourage her to, to give the exam. Uh, I don't think that, you know, it is as difficult to keep family life in the IS or IPS as in foreign service. You have to make a sacrifice and you must have an understanding spouse. For instance, suppose you are posted in Chhattisgarh or in a, some Maoist infested area. You are district magistrate, there is a woman. Your husband is posted in the cap state capital. You can't then let a little girl pick up and say, excuse me, you know, I am very afraid. I might be assassinated tomorrow morning. You are there, you made a choice. You made a choice, you are a woman. It is also very important for empowered women to always remind themselves. <coughs> you made that choice, you have to stick to it. So that people don't say, oh, that's some silly woman, she doesn't know how to handle it. So, it's difficult in the police service. 
When you see a mob, you have to control it. You're the superintendent of police. It is very difficult as, an as a woman ambassador in a large embassy with people pulling in different directions or trying to understand what is in the woman ambassador's mind. So then it's equally difficult being a male ambassador. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult profession, full stop. So when you get into it, don't think about whether it will get you good scores or bad scores. If you have, if you have the important thing when you get into any of these services is to have an understanding scores and to wait until you get one and not to think about it. Can I take a last two questions if I may? I think, uh, I think Ambassador Sudan had a question. When we are talking about a journey, it's over a time period, right? So as I could see from your lecture, we are talking about last 60, 70 years old, we are not before that. Here in the 60, 70 years, change is must, change would happen. The whole society changed. In that context, so what is your last word? Change or status quo? What do you see it talking about? And there are no views on it. Well, a couple of comments. You know, because the lecture was titled Change or Status Quo. I think it's both. And I think, you know, I get the sense that you will emphasize the status quo over the change. I may be wrong on that. But uh, you see, in India, you know, we've seen that a constant history of male pastors being, you know, uh, you know, being, being, being uh, uh, overcome by, by, by women. And uh, for example, apart from the politics, folks talk about the civil service and diplomacy, but. One of the ultimate male bastions worldwide is the financial sector. And here in India, we have actually a quite a record of women occupying the highest positions in the banking industry. And of course, not to speak of the fact that uh, among the most famous Indian, you know, you know exponents of what are traditionally called male sports uh, are women. So we have, you know, I mean, India's most famous wrestlers. I mean, women, and India's most famous bugleist is a woman. Now, let me also respond to your, you know, you, know, you get the impression that men, you know, sort of have this, have this, you know, sort of uh, networking arrangement among themselves, and that this networking is intended to keep women in that place. But let me give a slightly different perspective. Okay. I didn't say that. You didn't say that, but I didn't say it. Okay. Now, you know, this goes back many years when I was a graduate student in the US. And then, you know, Indian students would come, there would be women, there would be men, there would be boys actually. And so the boys would, <coughs> several of each of them would take an apartment on rent, several of each of the girls would take an apartment on rent. At the end of the year, the girls all fell apart, they wouldn't talk to each other, the boys <laughs> got on just fine. <laughs> 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 Well, thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, Dave for giving me the opportunity. And I also I find it uh, uh, pertinent to commend this excellent lecture, the presentation made by Ambassador uh, Swat Mukherjee. Actually, uh, uh, is an excellent one, very dedicated to me in particular. And I think the gender women all over the world are very similar. In, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, with different, slight differences. But the struggle is one of all women. And I think women have achieved a lot uh, in the global level. Uh, the United Nations now have a uh, stance and have a uh, position regarding uh, the issue of gender. And uh, women in India should celebrate and this achievement in the global level. And I think uh, uh, we need all to work together in order to empower women economically and, and socially, uh, and that will bring peace and stability. Those phenomena that we see, uh, the bike extremism, intolerance, and violence, are all responsibility of all the society together, women and, and, and men together. So uh, thank you very much for this lecture. And I also commend the, the excellent contributions from the floor. Very interesting. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can we get the mic here? You go ahead and make it.
so my question relates to how uh, sometimes women tend to reinforce certain backward practices themselves. And in this context, uh, I understand that some choices available to women in India would be externally determined. Uh, I would be curious to know what your thoughts are on how self-determined these choices can be potentially as we go forward. Excellency, the one in front of you. Thank you. I don't have any question. I learned so many things tonight. Tell us about the journey of the Greek woman. Maybe the Greek man. It's not uh, perhaps as different as one thinks. It is only that it took place uh, a similar process uh, many centuries ago, and therefore today the Greek woman is uh, very formidable. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, part of our, um, of our society. But again, I, I wish to, to thank you. I did not come as a thought. I <laughs> arrived when we were still talking about the um, about the uh, reform uh, process in Bengal. Uh, so uh, I followed your uh, very enlightening uh, in, uh, in lecture, and I uh, thank you very much. And I also, as my colleague, would like to comment uh, the quality of uh, the questions that uh, denotes a certain uh, curiosity, intellectual curiosity on the side. Okay, now I'm going to request yeah, yeah, some yeah, speaker yeah. One, give Twitter, sir, just please wait. <coughs> give some Twitter kind of responses because I have a few more uh, people who would like to make a comment. So, Bashwati, quick responses to the two or three questions. Well, I'm not going to uh, respond to Pradeepana's uh, very provocative comment. I think I'll leave, I leave Minashi to deal with it. <laughs> but all I can say is that I do agree that uh, uh, the financial sector, in fact, it's a very significant area where we make uh, progress. Uh, there, there was, there's a very interesting comment which has been made about uh, women uh, also reigning in other women. Uh, I think actually it's due to, as I said, due to lack of education. Uh, I find that as education, as women become more educated, they don't reign in women. They want women to have greater opportunities than they had themselves. So I think it actually with lack of education and illiteracy uh, rather than anything else. Uh, as far as deciding on choices are concerned, as I've already said, these are very informed choices we need to make. Uh, the consequences can be drastic, and the consequences can alter your destiny for the rest of your life. So when you make those choices, you have to be conscious, fully conscious of the consequences of the choices that you make. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my dear friend and Excellency Ambassador of Sudan. Uh, we were together in Netherlands. Uh, he has actually brought a whole perspective. Uh, and then maybe next time we should speak about the journey of the African woman, which is very interesting. And I'd like to also thank uh, Panos, my dear friend, Ambassador of Greece, uh, for his comments. Yes, uh, the quality of questioning actually shows that the journey of the Indian woman is moving forward. And I actually uh, would answer Abhijit's question by saying that in my lecture, I actually talked about the journey not being over, which means the status quo has changed but not enough and not for everyone. It may have changed for me, it may not have changed for another woman. I, I feel the journey is complete when everyone, all women in India, have that opportunity of, of decision making, of choice that I had. Then I feel that the journey is complete. So that's my answer to your question. Okay, I'm going to slide to yeah. now. I can see this is a very interesting discussion. And at 8.30, I will turn into a pumpkin. So therefore, my request is, those of you who have raised your hands, I've recognized you, I'll request our speaker, and that's Mukherjee, perhaps to speak to you after we close the session, because there are a few people who have fights to catch and dinner engagements to keep. So with your permission, Jawar, you can please make the children to catch a flight. Thank you so much, Jawar. Jawar, by the way, is a male chauvinist, but he's, he's improving with time. Okay. So with your permission, I have a few hands. I request Bashar to take me questions. My dear sisters, I said formally I would bring this to an end if I may. I have come to add some points to make. First of all, before I thank Ambassador Mukherjee for a very interesting lecture. You know, we had a lot of uh, discussion on this. And I think she's given us a very compelling, as I said, overview of a very complex subject. But before that, let me thank all of you in the audience.
because habitat normally 8, 8, 10 is the cutoff time. I've sat on this side of the room many times and sort of been a little concerned that you know people have to leave, and I'm saying this in a very positive way. The pressures of Delhi and the traffic can be very challenging. So to have an almost full Gulmohar at half past eight is a very major, shall we say, uh, indicator. So let me thank all of you and just one phone line. So I think that's a very good type. Self-regulation also, thank you for looking at that. And the only sort of minor point I want to make is to say that this is a subject on which there is no last word. And we at the SP, as the Society for Policy Studies and the Habitat, see this as a continuing dialogue. And one way of doing this is we have a fairly active website. It's called the South Asia Monitor. So those of you who would like to contribute and keep this going, please uh, feel free. And the other sort of thumb rule we have in the SPS is that we operate on what is called the Pagwash principle, meaning that once you attend one of our events, we hijack you. So you become a member whether you like it or not as part of the extended fraternity. We have a couple of our younger researchers, this Chaya there, if you just raise your hand, and Sharzad here, who are helping us to sort of get the addresses and so on. If you want to be part of the group and get our invites, please leave your cards with them and your email. We'll make sure you get our next invite. And if you want to contribute and write something, the magic word is 900 words. If you can say your piece in less than 900 words, why you don't agree with what Marshall is saying, we'd be happy to hoist it and you know keep the discussion going. The text of our lecture will be on. They can agree also. Right, they can agree also, most certainly. <laughs> But those who can say, dissent is interesting when it's sort of put across in the appropriate way. But seriously, if you want to contribute to the debate, please feel free. The text of her lecture, by the way, it's a very rich lecture. I took the liberty of requesting her to really trim it a bit, but it's more than 5,000 words. She's done a lot of work, and we have it up there on the website, and you can, as I said, feel free to contribute. On that note, I've seen three or four of you. Please come up and request Bhaskati to sort of engage. May I, Mr. Dave, thank the Habitat as always for your sustained support in keeping this alive. <laughs> we'll be doing this again. And at the very end, let me thank uh, Ambassador Mukherjee for a splendid lecture. And thank all of you for being here till half past eight. On that note, thank you very much, Excellency. And for being here with us and all the other members who are here. Thank you.